Hello and welcome back to the channel. You join myself, Dr. James Gill, for a new clinical skills and adjacent video. Today we're going to be looking at the lumbar spine. Looks like a lollipop, but I assure you it's not. The reason why I thought this would be a good idea to go over is that when it comes to low back pain, it's actually the vast majority of the time we're talking about issues from the lumbar spine. So I thought it worthwhile to discuss the anatomy of the lumbar spine, but also pay attention to that very common source of back pain, sciatica, and perhaps explain what goes on here with regard to the discs and how that causes pain because it's really useful to be able to explain to a patient what's actually going on when they come in and say they've got a slip disc because as you'll see I'm not a fan of that as a description because the disc doesn't so much slip as it pops but we'll have a look at that when we get into the vertebral anatomy. So when we're talking about the lumbar spine, broadly we're talking about seven structures. We've got the bottom five vertebrae, that's L1 to 5, the intervertebral discs themselves, the spinal cord running down the length, the nerve roots when they're coming out, and the ligaments and muscles that hold the whole thing together, and finally the blood vessels, which often you don't see on these sorts of models, which keep everything fueled and oxygenated. So first off, let's look at the vertebrae. Realistically, when these are all stacked together, they form the vertebral column, or spine, as often people would describe it. But we're going to discuss the lumbar spine as it gives a clearer picture to what's going on. Now, in biology, form will follow function, and we can very much see that with the vertebral bodies because the spine bears 80% of a person's weight and the lumbar vertebrae have grown in size to compensate for this. This is particularly noticeable with these hockey puck shaped pieces of bone on the front of the vertebrae, the vertebral bodies. Now, interestingly, or at least it is to me, the vertebral body is comprised of two different forms of bone structure, which you can see on the model here. We've got a dense cortical shell on the outside, and this is required to ensure we've got even force distribution across the vertebral body. This is a very stiff bone, and it means that the body is able, or the spine, is able to bear those compressive loads of walking, running, and jumping, basically life without buckling. But then form following function. The cortical shell encases a second bone type. This is the spongy trabecular bone. The trabecular bone, as you can see here, is quite different in appearance. It, it, it looks spongy, and that's critical to the absorption of forces, which is the main, or one of the main roles of uh, this bone. See, it's all well and good having this strong cortical bone that can withstand those axial forces without damage, but the lattice work structure of the um, trabecular bone here actually helps absorb those forces and efficiently transfer it to the cortical bone to allow dynamic movement, for want of a better phrase. You don't want the force going in and then passing through the force of least resistance. That's how you end up with fractures. Now, interesting enough, the bones of the spine aren't inert structures. This spongy trabecular bone is actually filled with a very active metabolic tissue, red marrow. And that's crucial because it plays a role in production of red blood cells, also termed hematopoiesis, which is a, a lovely chewy word. Um, the vertebral bodies, though, they play an important role as well in mineral and storage, particularly calcium and phosphate, but that's a little bit more than we're dealing with today. Taking away that metabolic side, obviously the main role of the spine is that of support and movement. And both realistically are made possible because of these intervertebral discs sat on top and below the vertebral bodies. Now the movement is further facilitated by something called hyaline cartilage, which is a layer that sits on the top and the bottom, superior and inferior, aspects of the vertebral body. Now, 
bear with me for a second. I've always frankly viewed the layup of the vertebral bodies in the spine with the uh, discs as a little bit like a cucumber sandwich. You've got the two bodies on top, they're covered in this buttery highline cartilage and a thick slice of cucumber in between. Now, keep that idea of a cucumber sandwich in mind, as I do think it helps understand the problems with the discs, which we're going to come to shortly. But let's leave our cucumber sandwich for a moment and go back to the bony anatomy. Let's move posteriorly from the vertebral body, and then we come to the vertebral arch, which is sort of the back bit here, with all these spiky bits coming off. Now, the crucial thing here is how the vertebral body and the arch together form a central hole, the um, vertebral foramen. Now, when the vertebrae are viewed as a collective, the whole spine, these foramen will line up to give us the spinal canal, or the vertebral canal, as it's sometimes called. Okay, so we've covered the vertebral body, we've, talk, we've talked about the arch. Now, let's cover these spiky bits at the back of the vertebrae. Starting most posteriorly, this is the spinous process, and it's the bit that's most prominent, that knobbly bit when, that you can feel in the middle of your back when you press your spine. The main function of this spinous process is as an attachment point for muscles, which allow for extension and rotation, as well as stabilization of the spine. It's also the site of ligaments that help the vertebral column maintain stability. Okay, so that's the spinous process. Then connecting in, we've got these small slivers of bone called the lamina. These form the posterior walls of the vertebral arch and largely part of the spinal canal. It does seem like a simple, straightforward junction between the spinous processes and the transverse processes, which is reasonable. However, there is another piece of tissue called the ligamentum flavum, and crucially that attaches here. It's this big fibroelastic band that stretches all along the posterior wall of the vertebral canal, and it helps both stabilise and prevent excess movement of the spine. But it has what I think is a very cool function, that because of its very elastic nature, this ligament and flavin also helps return the spine to the neutral position once you've you know, been bending forwards and backwards and things. So in doing so, we're focusing on that elastic response of the ligament and flavin, so we're not putting excess strain on the other structures. And to be fair, there's probably an element to be said about energy saving, but I don't know that one for a fact. So now we're going to come to the wings of the vertebrae. These are the transverse processes and they come out laterally. These are areas of, you know, large areas of muscle insertion and they act as levers with regard to helping for flexion, extension and twisting motions. And this is tend to be through muscle groups like the erector spinae, quadratus lumborum and the other deep spinal muscles. Very much like the vertebral arch protecting the spinal cord, the transverse processes also act to shield some of the nervous system, specifically the nerve roots and the blood vessels of the spine. If we come more superiorly though, we've got a, um, the superior articular processes arising just before transverse processes. Now these form facet joints down uh, the spine and again they help with aiding movement as they prevent excess movement and add to the stability of the lumbar spine. Finally at the bottom part we've got the pedicles which are going to connect the vertebral body and the arch together. In concert with the pedicles, the superior and inferior processes do create foramens through which the nerve roots will um, exit. Now, that's very, very crucial because although we've wrapped up the bony part of the spine, that exit part of the nerve root is going to play a crucial part in issues with sciatica. So let's look at some of those softer parts, particularly the nerve roots. As you said, the, the lumbar nerve roots exit through the foramen on each side of the vertebrae. These are part of the peripheral nervous system and extend from the spinal cord out to the nerves uh, that are supplying the legs, pelvis and lower abdomen. 
all sounds pretty straightforward until there's a problem, which, as I've mentioned several times now, is often, not always, but often due to the intervertebral discs. The intervertebral discs are these fibro cartilaginous structures situated between the vertebral bodies. Now, if I go back to my cucumber analogy, if we think we've got that tough green outer skin and inside a more lighter jelly-like centre, the same is true for the intervertebral discs. There's something called the annulus fibrosus, a tough fibrous ring of type 1 collagen that's on the outside. And to be honest, you can kind of see that biology, certainly in the namings, very straightforward. It, you know, it does what it says on the tin. Annulus being ring and fibrosis being fibrous. So when we're talking about the annulus fibrosus, we're talking about a tough fibrous ring, which, going back to the cucumber, is on the outside. Then we need to deal with the squidgy bit inside. That's the nucleus pulposus. This gel-like centre provides flexibility and shock absorption within the spine. So very much like the cucumber, the annulus fibrosus, that thick fibrous tissue on the outside, keeps the nucleus pulposus in place and allows the pulposus to compress and absorb without moving out of position. And that's the crucial bit here. Now, it's very important to understand this structure and highlight why the concept of the slip disc, as mentioned, isn't actually accurate. So there's something called radiculopathy when the disc slips, I'm not, no, when the disc herniates, I'm sorry, I can't stay with slip disc, it herniates and then we get nerve compression because of the herniated intervertebral disc pressing on the nerve. Now, as I mentioned really early on, the disc hasn't slipped, it's actually popped. Now, the technical term for that is herniation, given that the definition of a herniation is an abnormal tissue protrusion through an opening. And that can occur anywhere in the body. When I was little, I had an inguinal hernia. Part of my bowel, the abnormal tissue, protruded through an opening, a defect in my abdominal wall, and I got this extra bulge coming out. Hernias are possible anywhere you've got basically a wall and a tissue or an organ on the other side. Hopefully put that one clearly. So nucleus pulposus bursts through the annulus fibrosis and doing so you end up with a bulge and that's often putting pressure either on the nerve root or the spinal cord. Now realistically the most common direction of herniation of a disc is posterior laterally Hence, very commonly, we get sciatica because it's the nerve root that's being compressed rather than spinal cord itself. However, the spinal cord can still be compressed and then we've got a world of problems and that comes into a medical emergency. And if we herniate even lower down the lumbar spine, then because the cord has no longer stayed as a cord-like structure at that point, it's become the um, cord equina, this Again, Latin, horse's tail looks like a horse's tail hanging down rather than a single cord. If you get a herniation pressing on the cord equina, then you can get massive problems in terms of what's called cord equina syndrome, where you lose function of the bladder, and bowel, your legs, and hence why somebody coming in with sciatica, I need to be able to show that there's no evidence of cord equina. These are big level problems. So either cordial quina compression, nerve root compression, whatever it is, if we've got the disc herniated and pressing on something, the definitive treatment is trimming of that herniation to hopefully remove the pressure, and then that'll hopefully allow the nerve to recover. That word hopefully is doing an awful lot of lifting, but perhaps we'll do another video on, you know, um, the specifics of nerve root compression and spinal cord compression at another point. But putting that to aside, we'll go for a small diversion into health and safety material. The reason being is you're going to see all these comments when you do health and safety stuff about bending from your knees and not your back. The reason being is when you bend forward, you put the greatest amount of pressure on the front of the intervertebral discs. 
which is fine. You know, we've got that annulus fibrosis protecting the nucleus pulposus, so we can withstand that pressure. However, when you pick something up using your in your arms, just using your back, you're using your spine as a lever, these forces are massively magnified. That does increase the risk of muscle damage, but it seriously increases the pressure on the nucleus pulposus, which if we've got all the pressure at the front, very little on the back, there's a greater likelihood of the annulus fibrosis failing and the nucleus pulposus pushing backwards. That rupture obviously is going to end up with a compression of some form. Again, hopefully you can see there why a slip disc is a poor view of describing these injuries. So we've said the main function of the intervertebral disc is to facilitate movement. I'm again going to go right back to my cucumber sandwich analogy. If you try rubbing two pieces of bread together, everything's going to fall apart. Now, if you butter them, that movement might get a little bit easier. Realistically, it actually gets stickier, but stay with my analogy. However, if you then put some cucumber between that butter and the bread, you're suddenly going to get much less friction and much more movement. This is the purpose of the discs. The, the fibrocartilaginous cartilage works with the hyaline cartilage on the vertebral bodies to enable that smooth turning movement and flexibility of the spine, which is one of the reasons why these tissues can also end up with simple wear and tear as we age because whilst they're reducing friction that constant movement and pressures that they're under will over time lead to degeneration and that's not in terms of causing um, herniations that's just straightforward pain and reduced mobility but as the whole system is wearing out it's also going to increase the risk of herniation so basically if you have back pain make sure that you're doing proper lifting techniques because unless you've had MRI scans and things like that you don't know exactly where that pain is coming from so assume that you've just got a little bit of wear and tear and therefore the probability of a herniation if you put too much force through your back um, is increased. I think you can see that I honestly think the intervertebral discs are the most interesting part of uh, the spine. I mean it doesn't only allow that movement but all the compression and shock absorbing. You know, Think about what you're able to do in terms of running and jumping, rolling, you know, and your spine just says yeah and it takes it. And we've said before we've got a huge amount of shock absorbing coming from the trabecular bone but it's nothing compared to the shock absorption from the intervertebral discs. Any patient that's had a lumbar discectomy will tell you that they feel like some of the bounce has been taken out of them because they can't well, absorb those same shocks. Well I think this is probably a good place to leave things today. Um, we've discussed the anatomy of the lumbar spine We've commented on the various bony prominences throughout the vertebrae and outlined the function and issues that can uh, befall the intervertebral discs. So I hope this has been useful for yourself and I've not waxed lyrical about the discs too much as opposed to any other parts of the anatomy. But if it has been useful, please give the video a like and um, you know put a comment down below. That um, you know, might guide us to how we um, going to produce other videos. I know this one has been requested for a while. Um, with that in mind, take care and I'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.